Are we ready to go? Welcome to Cassandra Lunch, number 136. Don't forget to like and subscribe, as well as turn on the notification bell, so you can get notified every time we post a video or go live. Uh, today, we will be discussing APIs with Cassandra. Um, the co-organizers for this event are Rahul and myself. Uh, if you are interested in being a co-organizer and want to help get speakers by reaching out to people in the Cassandra community around the world, drop me an email. My email is listed below. Uh, you can also reach out to us at this marketing email. If you want to give a Cassandra Lunch talk or uh, talk at our sister event, Data Engineers Lunch, please feel free to reach out to me at either of these two emails. We are part of a larger community called Data Community DC, which believes in building an inclusive environment. So no matter your race, gender, or sexual orientation, everyone is welcome, and we expect respect to be given to all. Data Community DC is actually made up of a lot of different groups, generally centered around data. You can find out more about all the various groups and events at datacommunitydc.org. What do we cover here at Cassandra Lunch? We cover all things that are talk and play well with Cassandra. We cover open source Cassandra enterprise variant variants such as DataSac, Scylla, Keyspaces, Cosmos DB, and Yugabyte. We also talk tools in the ecosystem of Spark, Kafka, and Airflow. If there's anyone new here that would like to say hi, what brought you here, or what you hope to get out of this, drop something in the Zoom or YouTube chat. If you are watching on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe, as well as turn on the notification bell. Few rules. If you have a question, please ask it. Always be polite and courteous to others and share what you know with us. Uh, Rahul has indicated he's okay with um, being interrupted at a normal moment. So if you put a uh, question in the chat, I will bring it up to him um, when it comes up. Here at Anot, we design, build, and manage global real-time data and, and, and analytics platforms surrounding Cassandra, Spark, and Kafka. So Cassandra is our bread and butter. We also have a active... Um, LLM and generative AI practice. So if you're interested in bringing AI into your business, please reach out to us. Thanks to um, all of our sponsors, um, Datastax and George Washington University. Uh, GW helps uh, provide venue space when we do in-person events. Thanks to all of our institutional and organizational sponsors. If anyone has any job offers or is looking for a job, drop links and we will uh, just put them in the YouTube chat. If anybody has any meetups, hackathons, classes, or conferences that you would like to promote, please post those links as well. Uh, we currently host Cassandra Lunch on Thursdays at noon e Eastern time. Uh, we are open to a more variable time slot and we're talking about pre-recording some of these. Um, if you're for our sister lunch, Data Engineers Lunch, those happen on Mondays. We're doing uh, no-code lunches on uh, Wednesdays every other week. All of our videos are available on YouTube starting at Cassandra Lunch 10 on the Cassandra Lunch playlist. Uh, I'd also like to mention uh, Cassandra.link, which is a hand-curated site that Anant maintains with tons of resources for, connect for Cassandra. We also have um, a series of public runbooks, which you can find um, on our site at anant.us slash runbook. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rahul. Um, thank you so much for doing this, Rahul. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nick, um, for hosting. And um, wow, 136 episodes. That's a lot. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, that is a lot. Um, well, you know, uh, I think we've been going strong with different topics, and um, I think it's good to revisit some topics from time to time again. Um, one in particular, which is APIs. Uh, everybody needs to know how to make APIs, use APIs in software development. Um, you know, it wasn't as big of a thing when we did not have single page application frameworks like React, Angular, and a lot of the, the server side frameworks like ASP.NET, Java, JSP, you name it. Um, they all did the database transactions through objects or 
uh, services in the background and the user would do an interaction with the website, the website would basically go and um, go tell the server, hey, go fetch this information. The server would go fetch the information through some sort of business logic layer object and it would come back and it would send it back through HTTP. And I want to say back in 2002, three and four, a lot of sites, maybe even earlier, start to have what's what we, you know, we don't even talk about Ajax, but Ajax was a big thing where uh, it's called asynchronous Java and XML. And what Ajax would do was it would call an API, maybe it was an XML RPC, like a REST API that just gave XML kind of, um, and it would then parse it and then it would update the XHTML on the front end. And what the big deal was that when you did a user interaction, you did not have to go paint the whole page again. You could just go get the piece of data that you need and you could update it. And as more people started to do these single page applications and folks started to get away from like web services in the sense like, you know, SOAP shared object access protocol uh, and REST became popular, um, REST APIs, became not only the way to get data from a database to a web page, but that's like the way to uh, interact between systems, between backend systems, between front end systems, uh, doesn't really matter. And yeah, there are other ways. GRPC is another one that's you know, pretty popular these days. Um, REST is by far the most popular way that people make applications talk to each other. Um, and so it's important to kind of bring that all back and say, you know, yeah, Cassandra's cool. It does all these cool things, but eventually how do people use it? Well, they use it with APIs pretty much. Um, and so the topic I'm going to present is slightly different than what I had asked you to put online, which is I'm going to talk about quickly getting an API for Apache Cassandra. Like what the goal is, uh, is still the same from, you know, the topic perspective, but there are many different ways to get an API for Apache Cassandra. So I'm going to share my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's coming through great. Great. And and if you hear a dog in the background, that's that's my dog. What I'm going to do today is just do a quick survey review of what the current ready to go no code low code you know api systems are for apache cassandra and it's not no code low code app systems i'm talking about api systems just to be clear here uh you're not going to have an app ready to go uh and then how do we use ai to potentially help us with you know apis and i'm going to cover a subset of code generators that i find uh are you know, pretty useful in the creation of not only APIs, but potentially the metadata for API generators. Um, and I think that's a common topic that I'm going to keep bringing back to, to this lunch is AI, how does it impact not only uh, the, the technology that we build using Apache Cassandra, um, you know, how does AI interact with Cassandra? Uh, we talked about vector databases in the past. Um, but also how can practitioners use AI to, to do the work faster is, um, I mean, it's coming <laughs> either, either, uh, somebody, you know, either you're going to learn to use AI to work with Apache Cassandra or somebody else is going to come take your job. Um, wow. That picture doesn't come out looking as good on here, but um, I asked I had, I asked GPT to make me a picture of, like an abstract picture of uh, APIs talking to a uh, distributed database, and this is what it came up with. So uh, anyways, the, what it says here is open source API systems require low code, no code, um, meaning, you know, um, it's a it's a requirement now that when you're making, you know, something with open source, generally either you're going to get some code that you use and you copy and paste and you change it, 
or you are using something that's giving you an API and it doesn't require you to code. It just requires you to configure it or do some low coding. And just to keep that in mind, right? Low code, no code is coming. Has been for a while, but it's now going everywhere. Uh, and the other thing is LLMs like GPT, Gemini, and Claude, they can handle hundreds of thousands of tokens up to a million tokens. What does that mean? Um, it means that you can give it a book and ask it to write a book and it will do that. That's what it means. And what it means for technologists is we can give it instructions such as, here's the full schema of my database, make me an API in this language and this framework. And it would be able to do that. Um, and it can do that now with some of the code generators. It's just won't be able to do it like for you know a thousand key spaces or a thousand tables um, because it's just it wouldn't fit in the context window. So when you combine this, okay, AIs can now help us program not just you know full APIs. They can actually create the metadata for these low code, no code API systems. The power now is in the hands of the user to say, what tools do I use and what tools do I use with the AI to quickly get these things up and running, right? So some shameless promotion, um, our, uh, our customers uh, basically want everything right now. Well, they want their users to have everything right now. And uh, we help those platform owners uh, reach beyond their potential. And uh, technologies like Cassandra, obviously, distributed databases can allow that. That's why we specialize in it. And we design uh, with a with a playbook. We build with our framework, and we manage platforms with our approach, uh, so that our clients can think and grow big. Uh, we have a playbook, not like an Ansible playbook, but we have a playbook around design, engineering, and building and managing large scale distributed platforms, uh, uh, data platforms. And then recently we're cooking up another playbook for uh, no code and then another one for AI LLM. Uh, you'll see a preview of the AI LLM one today. Our customers, AKA our sponsors who give us work, uh, more than happy to, to service more customers. So if you want help with Cassandra or AI with Cassandra uh, or anything around the ecosystem, um, happy to help. Agenda today, uh, we're going to look at some API code, meaning somebody else has wrote it. Uh, we're going to look at some API generators or proxies. Um, we're going to look at some API generated API code, um, or at least try to. And then also uh, try to get the AI to generate configurations for an API generator. So um, uh, these last you know, two are going to be experiments, and I'm, I'm just curious to see what, what, what JADGPT spits out. Um, this picture actually also is created by ChatGPT when I said, originally, give me a three-dimensional isometric diagram of APIs talking to a distributed database like Apache Cassandra. And this is what it gave me initially. So interesting picture. I don't know why I thought that, but it looks pretty cool anyways. I want to recap some stuff from, from previous Cassandra Lunch and DataStax Devs workshops. Uh, these are from almost three or four years ago. They're still relevant because ultimately, you know, there are very few, you know, very clean, easy to understand examples for how to make an API with Apache Cassandra in Python or in Node. And, um, you know, our Cassandra.API project still ranks pretty high on Google. So I, when I was Googling, like, what's out there today, it's still there. So I'm just going to give you a preview of the existing code that you can get from GitHub from our GitHub, and there's all tutorial on how to use it. And there's videos too. So if you're curious to, you know, how we made it, you can, you can watch the videos. Um, the Cassandra.API and the Cassandra.RealTime projects, uh, they cover a, a pipeline um, of how to get data into a Cassandra database and out of it using REST API. And at the same time, um, how to use Kafka and Spark and uh, you know Kafka stream processing to manipulate and, and update information in, in real time. 
give me one second. I'm going to be right back. Uh, while we're waiting on Rahul, um, I just want to again thank everyone for being here. Um, and uh, note that um, our website, Nanta.us, um, you can access our Cassandra runbooks um, through that site, um, which is in the comments. Um, you can, in general, go to a Cassandra link and learn so, so much about Cassandra. All right. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> I uh, just needed to get some water. Um, but this, all of this code uh, is available uh, on uh, GitHub. And uh, it's a really interesting uh, use case that we make, you know, most of our engineers that do anything related to development of APIs, they would go through this tutorial and uh, see how it's done. Uh, if you go to YouTube and look for, you know, REST API with Apache Cassandra, connecting Cassandra with Kafka and Spark, uh, you'll uh, you'll find some videos. Uh, and if you go to the actual repositories, they they also have links. And the code looks like this, right? Python REST API, very, very simple, nothing special. Hey, you know, uh, go connect to the Cassandra cluster. In this case, we're talking to Astra, uh, you know, get the version just to see that, you know, we can connect to it, right? Um, here's a route slash API slash leaves, you know, get the data from the database, use the JSON formatting and just spit it back out, right? quick and dirty slacker way of using Cassandra to make a REST API, which, you know, this little keyword is, is a game changer if you're making REST APIs that are spinning back JSON. Um, and it's, it's really, really simple. It's like, you know, how do you add a new item? How do you select it? How do you delete it? It's a CRUD, it's a CRUD API. And, uh, you know, in another um, session, we actually, used uh, ChatGPT to, this is from last year, January 14th uh, timeframe. Um, I don't know why I know that date, but um, you know, Cassandra API with ChatGPT, if you Google that, you'll, you'll see that, where we made some APIs or, or processes that were doing interesting things using OpenAI's GPT API. And it, it did a pretty good job of creating code. Um, and then another one, you know, where we say, here's, here's a re uh, REST endpoint, here's the, the function that's used, um, you know, improve this, right? And these code bases are actually, I'm oh, sorry, these prompts are actually using existing code. So I was copying and pasting certain code I had, and I had it improve it. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to give it a requirement and see if it can make an API for us, right? But what's the big idea? Uh, well, APIs, they standardize interfaces. They're database and technology agnostic, meaning if we make a REST API, if we make a gRPC API, uh, anybody that wants to talk to it can talk to it via that protocol. It's a protocol. Now, the big deal now, bigger than the fact that it's standardized, is that developers and API, or sorry, and AI can interact with the database in fact, ChatGPT's plugin ecosystem uses open API specs to tell the AI what the API does. But at the end of the day, it's still a REST API. Okay. Um, and agents, autonomous agents, they're basically interacting with outside systems using APIs. Right. So that's why it's a big deal. Uh, no code, low code builders now can use databases without knowing databases. Um, I'm talking about things like Bubble. I'm talking about things like Retool or AppSmith. Uh, you can just talk to the database without having to do any SQL. And the purists would say, well, no, you always need to do SQL. You always need to do CQL. You always need to do all of this stuff because if you don't know how to do that, then you're not a developer. Well, you know what? Quite frankly, it doesn't matter because the AI is going to do most of the development anyways, going forward. And, and what I envision is that we're going to describe systems 
either the AI is going to program it and maintain the, co the code 100%, or it's going to maintain metadata that another piece of software is going to execute. So what are low-code, no-code app system? They're basically storing metadata about the configuration of an app, and they're rendering it. And that designer is basically metadata for that app, right? So eventually, either we're not going to be programming, or we're going to be looking at systems built by AI, and we're going to be able to manipulate them by either talking to the AI or, you know, manipulating using no code or no code. So that's why APIs are a big deal. And there's a hundred but different way, reasons beyond that too. Uh, so some common approaches to API, writing an API, write it out, maintain your own code, uh, use a wrapper or a service like the generators, let the AI do it. Um, and depending on where you work and, and what kind of requirements you have, you may not be able to do anything except writing it out and maintaining the code. Uh, in other organizations, uh, there may be existing tools and technologies that allow you to leverage uh, like a code generator or a proxy or, gen or an API generator. And if you're lucky, you can have access to AI. So starting point, Obviously, I would say, as you go to Google and you say, Cassandra API, REST, Cassandra REST API. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to say that this video still kind of comes up on Google, so that's good. It's still relevant. Um, and then we have a website, Cassandra.link. If you go to uh, slash search, or you can just go to the, the homepage and just search there. If you look for APIs, there's roughly 150 results, 151 results. Uh, with all different site types of resources, articles, videos, GitHub repositories, um, and you know their tags, so you can filter um, things that are related to Kafka. Right. So there's some starting points. Somebody has done some work you can use. But if you really go deeper, some of it's code, some of it is you know ready-made API systems, and some of it are API generators. So let's take a look at. Uh, a few, and I'll, I'll open up the, the repo so we can take a look at them. But um, the ones that I would say you should look at, uh, obviously, Cassandra.api. Uh, but there's a couple from data stacks, devs. Um, there's a boot camp for making a full stack app, um, as well as another one that's focused on Spring Data, which is uh, a Java framework. Um, and a lot of enterprise applications use Spring, so that's a good one to take a look at. Generators, um, there are a few, uh, you know, Loopback, Dream Factory, um, they explicitly show support for Cassandra. These are all also, also open source. Um, I didn't actually include anything today that was not open source. So these are all open source. And um, Loopback allows you to connect to Cassandra and make a state and, and basically have a a framework to manage multiple APIs with, let's say, if you, have, if you have to talk to different databases, it's just a central place for you to manage your APIs. Um, Dream Factory is like that, but it also can generate code for you. And, and there's other things I'm not getting into, but you know they have things like open API, spec management, documentation generation, all that stuff, great best practices so that you don't have to you know, reinvent everything. Um, and then, there's also a project called jhipster, and jhipster does more than just uh, the API layer. It actually can generate the front end uh, using Angular. And um, there's a specific example of how to use Cassandra with it. It's, a, it's an app that was created using jhipster with Cassandra as an option. And, and jhipster is a tool where you run it and you say, I want an app to talk to Cassandra. I want this type of front end, and I want this is my object, and it kind of just creates code. No AI. It just creates code that works. And then there's finally some no code Cassandra APIs. Uh, there was another one that I would have put here, but nobody's really maintaining it. Uh, it's user grid. Um, I was talking to a few folks about you know, potentially reviving that project. And uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I actually spent a lot of time with. Apache user grid to try to get it to work with the latest version of Cassandra. Uh, at that time, it was three. Um, and it still is reliant on Cassandra 2 stuff. So it's it was just, it was too much work. Um, maybe one of these days when I find this guy free, free time. 
Uh, but today there are two good ones um, battle tested. Stargate is the actual project that Datastax uses to serve their Astra, Cassandra as a service. Meaning they have Cassandra in the back end, but then they use Stargate to publish REST, GraphQL, gRPC, JSON API. And um, we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper into that. Uh, and, and the cool thing about Stargate is that, I think still, each of the Stargate nodes, when it becomes connected to your Cassandra cluster, it is another Cassandra node that can handle CQL as well. So different different conversation. But uh, the other project I found recently, um, not that crazy popular, but reminds me a lot of user grade is called Para um, because it allows for a multi-tenant backend server for, for making apps. And that's what user grade was. And of course there's AI code generation. Um, so this is a preview of our AI LLM, you know, playbook toolkit, whatever you want to call it. And then a big part is code generation, as you can see. And these are all different types of open source projects in the AI, uh, you know, LLM ecosystem. And if you zoom in, uh, in code generation, there are, let's say 20 or so, and I, there's, and I keep adding more, um, but not all of them are relevant for Cassandra. So we'll take a few that are, uh, take a look at a few that are relevant. And um, some of them are tools where you give it um, what you need it to do in English, and it does it for you. It creates a complete program and may go through multiple steps. Um, and then there are others, let's say Cursor and Continue, which are more like GitHub Copilot. They run inside Visual Studio Code. And so you ask it to do something, it does it. You can select code and say, do something with it. I use GitHub Copilot. Um, but GitHub Copilot is not open source. Uh, that's why it's not on here. And there's another one called uh, Ader. And Ader actually runs the command line um, and reads all of your code and just assists you with, with programming tasks. Um, but at the core of all of these, these, these are all using some sort of large language model. So if you really dug deeper into these open source projects, you'd find that they're just using like OpenAI and with, with their special sauce in terms of a prompt. Um, so what we, what we can do is take a look at some of these and say, hmm, what's the, what's the special sauce here, right? So I'm gonna actually switch contacts to show you some of the code. And we'll start with, I think the exciting stuff is really in, um, let's, let's take a look at the spring data one, right? So there's one that Datastax puts out. And uh, I'm gonna share my screen again. It's different, different screen here. And this is the spring data starter, um, you know, and it takes about roughly about 10 minutes <laughs> to bring up a REST API using spring. If we take a look at the code, Rahul, could you uh, give us one or two uh, zoom ins here? That's better, thank you. Um, so here's the object, right, order. And there's the order object right here and the controller. And the and this is all, these are all spring conventions. So we can take a look at, this is a Java API and, you know, standard object. And then we have the order repository, which uh, is, you know, kind of the, um, I say it, um, you know, the interface, how does somebody that implements um, this using Cassandra repository, right? And 
it basically takes the Cassandra repository object and uses the metadata that we're giving it um, to be able to do things like lookups. So this is how it's, the metadata we're giving it here is the primary key. And based on this, right, based on this, we can do things like update order, delete order, um, all coming from the order repository but notice there's no there's no code that says that shows CQL. And the reason is because our order repository extends the Cassandra repository, given this object right here, and given this order primary key object right here. And that's it. It's able to uh, do this with some magic in the background, right? So, so spring data, great starting point, right? Um, another one I think uh, it's worth looking at is our Cassandra API. And the there's a few things to note here. So there is a, some code here to import data into the database as a test, right? Uh, but then when you go into uh, Aster API, there, there's code in Node, there's code in Python. Uh, and then the Aster UI uh, is able to talk to either of them. So there's a, there should be a parity between the API Node and the API Python. Uh, and these tests prove that. So these tests run against these, right? So if we take a look at the node code, uh, even though it's four years old, maybe we had to update some packages, um, but it does the same thing in, in Python. So there's some get, patch, delete, post methods, uh, and it talks you through how to test them uh, using Postman. Um, if we take a look at the source here, data processor. Yeah, so, you know, how to do select, um, how to do, here's another select. And this one actually is, I believe, a, yeah, select. Another select, where's the insert? There we go, there's an insert, right? So just Googling things, you'll, you know, you'll find stuff. And this is cool, I think this is fun. But eventually I think you end up saying, you know what, I don't wanna necessarily write all this code out. Uh, so, you know, Jay Hipster has this mindset of using conventions uh, that are really, you know, commonly used and you can use it to create a uh, an app, a full-fledged app, because it does the, the API and the UI. Um, and let's see, uh, the way that you do that is you you define it a metadata for what you're trying to do, and when you, you can generate your whole object, API, everything using uh, JHipster. Um, so when we were looking at the JHipster for Cassandra. That's just an example of a generated application. JHipster has all this built into it now. And I want to see if there's a JDL file here. I don't think they put the JDL file here, but um, you need some resource. Yeah, so this code is likely 100% generated uh, using JHipster. 
Um, let me see if I can find the JDL file. The generator web application. Um, let me see if I can just find it. I don't think I can find it, but let's see if the documentation shows us anything better. Of course, we wouldn't use this code. We would find out how to, uh, here we go, generate using JH3.0. You can find the documentation here. Um, da, da, da. Okay, so it uses it uses this JSON format. So let's take a see. Let's just take a look at this one right here. Okay, so these are all the metadata um, needed for JHipster to create your full framework. Um, Unfortunately, I, I still don't see the, the metadata for like what the, uh, well, here's a database type. Um, skip user management. You know, let's do a deep dive one of these days. Yeah, yeah. so I think, you know, this is one part of the metadata for JHipster. Um, let me see, you know what? I'm gonna use ChatGPT to help me in a second. Um, let me see what else it says. Um, you may find a specific loop generator hipster. So let's go to find this in the source. Yeah. So I'll come back to this. Um, there's there's two more. Dream Factory. Uh, it's in PHP. Uh, I don't know if I would use it because the Cassandra driver for PHP is has lost steam and you know I don't think anybody really wants to maintain it, but um Dream Factory's been around for a while. So I was familiar with it. I wanted to show it, but it has a lot of uh, database connectivity for different types of databases. Uh loopback is uh different. It doesn't generate code, but it gives you the um uh, framework for managing APIs, documenting APIs, and then it has connectors for different types of uh, databases and including Cassandra. So if you go to uh, take a look at the architecture, it's basically managing, uh, you know, your um, creation of the APIs. Um, and then it has a connector, common connector framework for different types of backends, not just databases, but other APIs. Um, so we do connector. And automatically acquires a create, read, update, delete from persistent model and creates an API. So yeah, now it does create APIs. Uh, that's cool. Uh, let's take a look at the Cassandra connector and you install it and you say loopback data source, you pick Cassandra, it connects, it installs the, the driver, And then you have to add other properties for how to print you know, the database connectivity. Um, and if you use loopback to define your object, it will create the CQL for you. And of course, it creates the APIs for you as well. So pretty cool. Um, so we have code you can copy from other people and learn. You can use these 
API generators, code generators, or you can use AI to help you. So um, few, um, you know, again, I didn't put all of these on there, but um, all of these are basically the same thing. They use OpenAI in the background. Um, some of them may be used. Yep, OpenAI key. <clears throat> Another one called Solid GPT. OpenAI key, right? So <laughs> pretty much all of them are using OpenAI. GPT Pilot, I think I mentioned, um, works inside Visual Studio. Um, yeah, there we go. But you can use other uh, Azure provider. So this one I haven't tested yet, but apparently um, it can train on a, a relational database and store the, the, the metadata for the, the vector, sorry, store the metadata for the relational database in a vector database. And so then when you ask questions, it finds how do you, you know, it finds in the, the relevant data definition language to construct the right SQL and executes it. But I don't know if it'll work with CQL, um, but because it's open source, it, it's kind of interesting to uh, maybe look into this, but I'm, I'm showing this because this is kind of the next level, right? Is not even having uh, APIs, uh, the AI answers the questions you want directly from the database. Um, cursor, like GitHub Copilot, uh, open Interpreter is not like GitHub Copilot. It's actually an open source version of what's in ChatGPT, uh, which is the code interpreter, or I think they call it the da advanced data um, analyzer, where when you ask a question, it creates Python code and executes it. Um, GPT Engineer is actually more of an attempt where you define um, you know, hey, this is a computer language, and you and you tell it what you want, and it creates the code for you. So this is like the sloop to nuts type of um, you know code generator that people people want. Um, GPT console is kind of how to do that on on your command line. Um, here's one that I've gotten good critical acclaim from other other folks, which is called Ader, and the way you use Ader is you know, you, you add a document or you add a, a, a Git root, you know, um, sorry, you add a Python file or let's say a node file to Ader and you say, here, I want to talk to this. And then you can say, you know, do this for my code and it will do that for you. So I don't know if it can like create code, maybe, uh, but it can definitely edit and improve code for you. This project E2B originally started off as a way to define um, you know, this is what I want for an API and it would create the API, but they've pivoted away to basically making it like a sandbox to run AI agents. Um, I, I, I really was disappointed because I, I have been talking about this, this project for a while and now it doesn't do what I want it to do. Um, developer, this is closer to, Hey, you know, here's what um, I want in my application, you know, make, make my application. So like you can give it a very simple request. Okay. So we looked at all these code generators, but the, the open AI chat GPT application is actually a really good starting point to, um, understand how does it actually do code generation? Right. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, so there are, this is the paid version of ChatGPT. So there are these, um, GPTs for coding, right? So if I look for like API, an API expert offering technical advice and examples, 
For, uh, for anyone wondering about GPTs, uh, these are going to be the long-term replacement for the plugin ecosystem. Uh, they're really planning to phase the plugin ecosystem out pretty soon and just essentially have channels in these GPT style things that do what plugins used to do. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, plugins are, uh, sorry, GPTs are basically a combination of plugins plus some context. So that's what they are. It's just a wrapper and it, it makes it easier for people to package it than, than to like, you know, because you have multiple, you know, APIs you want to connect in there. It's it's hard to do it with a plugin. Whereas here you can have your API, somebody else's API, and say use these tools to to do this. Um, so I'm gonna also look for a code generator. So yeah, code generation assistant at all levels. Let's see if I can find API code generator. There we go. Um API code generator. You know what? I'm going to uh, API to database code bases from docs in multiple languages. That's only got one comment on it, so I'm not really going to waste my time there. Custom API developer. That looks interesting. Um, but you know what? I'm going to look at this API expert. It has 1,000 conversations, meaning that many people are talking to it. Um, how do you integrate API X with my, well, you know, let's, let's start the check, right? Let's see what it does. And mind you that this has some expertise built into it that we can't see. It's some conversation that the developer of this uh, GPT had, gave it some knowledge and you can't really, you can't really see that, okay? But what I could ask here is um, I have a, I'm actually going to copy and paste a um, an object that I want to make an API for. So you know what I'm going to say, uh, I would like you to help me design an API that will manage the metadata for making my own GPT or custom GPT uh, ecosystem like the one you run on, okay? Let's see what it does. And it talks to me, talks to me, talks to me. Here we go, it says authentication, API key. That's not really what I wanted. Uh, oh, there we go. Create GPT model, list GPT models. Pretty cool. Give it a second. So it's it's probably using GPT-4. It takes a second for it to do that. Basically, reverse engineered itself. Well, not really, but... <laughs> At least the API endpoints. Um, wow, kind of kind of speechless. It's this. Ah, here we go. GPT model, and it's starting to now list all the data models related. Um, Interesting. Okay, so it it gave a pretty you know such substantial um, you know report. Um, so what I'm going to add here is, can you make me the code for the API to manage the GPT model in Apache Cassandra in Python? Uh, okay, using uh, 
I'm going to use Flask. I know some of my friends don't like Flask. That doesn't matter. That tells me to make a key space. Tells me to create, oh, look at that, table. Uh, it knows some CQL because it, you know, that's a CQL thing right there. Um, tells me to install it. And not bad. Not bad. Um, now, what I'm curious to see is what a type of configuration key value pairs <laughs> it thinks it needs to manage. Because it's pretty generic, right? It's any type of configuration goes in here. So I'm going to, after it's done with this, I'm going to say, can you write me some test code for this API? Yeah, so it's using a unit test. Ah, uh, here's the magic. Okay, so it kind of like skimped, right? Like I want it to be a little bit more specific here. So uh, what I'm going to ask it after it finishes this is, can you be more specific? the actual real configurations that may need to be stored for a custom GPT. Still functions. And notice like this guy keeps advertising themselves which is fine. It's his GPT. That is super annoying. Custom GPT FinTech. Ah, model size, fine tuning, data set. Okay. Uh, I don't know. What, okay, I guess it's for API limits. Mm -hmm. It's doing its best. <laughs> um, and it's thinking about things that I would not have thought about, actually, um, which is good. Nice. And I'm going to ask another one. What about a custom GPT that talks to an external open API REST? API, open API compliant, that's API. What a test to, and what I'm doing is I'm basically forcing it to know its code when I say, write me a test, rather than, well, what does it look like, right? It, it has some self-referencing knowledge of the previous context. so it's likely going to give me code that actually will work because it wrote its code earlier. Um, so what it's doing here is actually making a mock API response, which it's going to use internally. Interesting. Well, there you go, folks. Um, it definitely, this this API custom GPT is pretty good. Uh, I would actually use this again. And, you know, the real test is, um, can you write me this API in TypeScript using NestJS, which is a TypeScript server-side framework? And let's see if it complains. 
it's thinking, it's thinking, it's thinking. In the meantime, uh, Nick, are there any questions or comments or did you have any? Um, nothing that hasn't been addressed in the chat, um, from the chat. Uh, I did have some comments here. Um, I think the idea of asking it to write a test for its code, something that's going to stick with me, sort of for forcing it to sort of reuse what it generated and then prove its work. Uh, yeah. I think that's pretty valuable. Yeah. Um, so it actually used um, Nest's kind of like ecosystem of tools where you can say, create a module, create a service, create a controller. And then it says, edit this file and put this in here. Um, and, but the thing that like, I, I, I have to keep coming back to uh, these tools is that sometimes ChatGPT just is lazy. Oh, and include some other code as needed. It's like, well, I want you to make the whole thing for me, right? And so what I will do here is I would go back and I would edit this and say, my job depends on this. Please don't skip any lines with comments, right? Like this is actually one of the magic things you can tell it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is really, really funny. <laughs> but it's it crazy that I mean I I know about take it step by step, um, but that's another key phrase to remember. There, my job depends on this. Please don't, please don't skip any steps with comments. So so why do I know that? Because some of the early uh, agents that were trying to get JSON back, right, from like some interpretation and send it to another API, you need you need legitimate JSON, right? Um, or you say, here's my content, structure this content into JSON for me, right? And it would make wrong JSON, it wouldn't be exact. So then they started saying, here's my object schema. Please make sure it fits the schema, my job depends on it. And it started to really like click, I was like, oh, okay. So if you give it an importance, it actually doesn't take any, you know. Uh, and, and so what did it do? Look at that. It started to do that for, for us as requested. It finally got there, right? Get, so it did one of them. Maybe, maybe did, did, a, did a get and then uh, in a listing. You know what, this it's is a start. Running into the token limit there probably. No, so we're using GPT for probably 100, I mean, this is a lot of tokens. Right, this is probably using the 32k or the 120k at this point. So, anyways, um, what I didn't get to was um, using Chat GPT to create the metadata for one of these tools. I think what would have been interesting is, you know, uh, and I'm gonna just continue running it, but like, hey, give me the IDL description or give me the metadata that I need to use J Hipster to do this. And then copying and pasting it and giving it to JHipster and having it do that. And I think that that's the like the wisdom that I've kind of collected is that AI, traditional machine learning AI does really good stuff. Um, large language model AIs do really good stuff. Databases do what databases do. LMs won't replace a database. Um, but there are these code generators. They do what they do really, really well. Like, why reinvent the wheel? Like it's just another technology that works really well. So having the LLM kind of like do that configuration task is fascinating to me because it's a robot telling another robot what to do. All right. Um, We're living in the so, future, man. Yep. Well, hey, sorry we went over a little bit, but um, I want to I want to continue this topic in a couple uh, cycles. Um, maybe do a full walkthrough of you know making. Maybe do two or three of these, right? Maybe we can take the Cassandra API uh, code and actually improve it with AI. I think that would be kind of cool. Right. Yeah, I, I was thinking along similar lines that um, you know setting up an actual Cassandra database and then testing the code on an actual database would be something pretty interesting to see how much adjustment we have to do to get it to the code to actually function. Yep. Well, thanks everybody for joining, and hope to see you. Next time. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Okay.